glad to be here again. Uh, so let me start uh, with one number, um, two billion. In the world today, there are about two billion people which are considered to be underbanked. So underbanked are people, I mean, that use financial services, that also most of the time have a bank account, but in general have big problems when it comes to access to finance. So banks are not focusing on that customer group and they're not considered a priority. To give you two examples, underbanked are people like Maria. Maria lives in Guadalajara in Mexico. I mean, she runs her own restaurant, and one day she wakes up and I mean, figures out that she needs money I mean, to finance new equipment. No bank will lend to her. Or underbanked are people like Piotr, I mean, who lives in, um, in Wokla in Poland, and he's a freelance uh, designer. And I mean, he needs at some point capital to buy a new computer, which uh, I mean, also banks are not, uh, not granting him. In most of the um, developed and emerging world, I mean, a lot of the low to middle class, I mean, is, is underbanked. This is, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is in fact, in um, you know, a real problem, and I think um, the reason behind that is, first, I mean, that those people are not necessarily employed in a regular fixed-term job uh, where they work nine to five and have, I mean, a, a stable income. I mean, most of the underbanked are people that are self-employed, work as a seasonal, a seasonal worker, I mean, have multiple jobs. So for banks, it's very hard to understand the income pattern of those customers. The second thing that adds to it is, I mean, that there's usually little or no credit history, given that those people have never um, yeah, used, um, used, used credit before. Um, for banks, it's a lot of effort to understand the credit risk of these uh, customers, and they say, well, I mean, before we're trying to, I mean, build a very complex rating system that requires, I mean, a lot of manual um, interaction, and it's very cost-intensive, you rather focus, I mean, on the, on the people with high income and, and sell them more and more credit cards. The difficulty uh, when it comes to credit ratings is basically to understand two dimensions. There's ability to repay and there's willingness to repay. Ability basically means that someone is economically capable of repaying and, and making, making payments for, for a loan without putting basically him, him um, into a difficult situation. And willingness means actually whether someone wants to repay and has the intention to honor, to honor his obligations. So like in a traditional lending process, I mean, yeah, it, it basically works like that the customer comes to a bank, I mean, it has to provide a bunch of documents, I mean, like income statements, tax returns, and so on, I mean, to prove his ability to repay. And then the bank goes to the credit bureau and pulls the credit report and looks at the past credit history and thinks of, well, I mean, if someone managed to repay loans in the past, it's probably very likely, I mean, that this person will also repay loans in the future and therefore, I mean, has high willingness to repay. So the problem is, first of all, I mean, I mean, for an underbanked person, it's very difficult, I mean, to provide that proof of income because, I mean, they need to well, carry all these documents. It's very hard to get together. It's very inconvenient, particularly in the digital world. And second of all, and this is actually the bigger problem, is that, I mean, yeah, the credit bureau system in, in many cases is really not working for them. Um, Credit bureaus, I mean, as you know, are networks. So, I mean, they collect information from financial institutions and in turn, financial institutions can pull information from them. So in that reporting process, I mean, a lot of the time, I mean, the information doesn't come through properly. I mean, it can be outdated, it can be missing. It's rather unreliable. Then there are countries in the world where credit bureaus, I mean, are just basically in the process of being established or they're not even there yet and only cover a small section of the population. And last but not least, in many countries, particular developed countries, I mean, credit bureaus are constrained by law with which information they can actually share, and that also then mainly works for bad cases. So in some, I mean, the process does not work, I mean, in, for, for a lot of people around the globe. And I think the irony about that is, I mean, that, well, I mean, if you can't do a credit rating because there's a lack of data, we live in a world today where everyone basically produces more and more data every day by the use of smartphones, by sort of like their footprint on web and social media, and by basically using all these online services, I mean, that everyone uses today. And in fact, actually, that information, I mean, provides a pretty good indication on some of these qualities which are important, I mean, that, that, make, a, that make a good borrower. And the 
basically biggest advantage in today's world is that also most of this data is very transferable. So for instance, I can grant API access to my bank account and share my financial history, basically with the click of a button, and financial institutions can use that to very easily understand my ability to repay. Or likewise, I can use, I mean, I can basically authorize API access to my LinkedIn or to my Facebook profile and, I mean, provide additional proof about my identity and therefore give trust into my willingness to repay. What we have done at Credit Tech is basically build a rating system that takes advantage of this alternative data to replace the credit bureaus um, and complement the credit bureaus in the rating process. And we do that by using modern age technology from the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence that helps us to process that information. So you need to think of that machine learning is basically a, a tool set of like, smarter statistics that helps us to understand patterns and relationships in the data that, I mean, traditional statistics is not able to discover. And the advantage of that is um, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of these individual relationships, I mean, that, uh, yeah, I mean, are not as straightforward as saying, hey, I mean, this is someone with a high income in a fixed-term job, so he's basically good for making him a credit, can be detected, and therefore gives us a very, very powerful instrument to do the credit rating. It's actually not just the credit rating that we derive. In fact, we derive a fully personal loan offer. Means, I mean, understanding what is actually the rate that is um, suitable for the customer to pay based on his affordability, uh, what is his monthly installment, uh, what is, I mean, certain things of repayment flexibility, such as like allowing him to skip a payment and so on that we want to offer to make this credit offer as good as possible for this customer. To give you some insights into how well actually our system is working, let's take a look at one of our markets, Mexico. So the great thing about a machine learning based system is that it becomes better with every new piece of information it sees. So with every new loan, I mean, there's a bit of learning that we can infer that helps our model to work better. In Mexico, as of today, we have originated more than 80,000 loans. And when we started, we actually almost accepted everyone because we wanted to understand as much as possible which are the patterns that good and, uh, well, I mean, non-repayers have in common. And in turn, I mean, more than 60% of people actually ended up not repaying. So which is obviously, I mean, quite, quite bad and no lending company in the world can operate profitable under that. But over time, our model picked up patterns and we started to make predictions which are good customers. And so we iterated over time so that as of today, we managed to really bring that down to below 20%, which is way, way, way above market standard in that country. And that's really for a customer segment which banks really have not dared to step into because they're afraid of the credit risk. The business we have built around that technology is an end-to-end -end consumer lending company. So that means we actually acquire customers, we underwrite the credit risk, we finance the loans, and we manage servicing and collection. We do it in five markets today. Uh, we are in Poland and Spain and Czech Republic in Europe. We are in Russia and we are in Mexico. And in general, we like markets that have sort of like a big inefficiency when it comes to supply and demand in, in, in consumer credit. In all of the markets, we're locally regulated and, of course, compliant with all, with all uh, local laws. We offer a broad range of credit products, I mean, starting from very short loans, I mean, just 100 euros to be repaid in seven days, and go all the way, I mean, to larger personal loans, a couple thousand euros to be repaid over several years in, in installments. And... Um, um, most of our originations today are driven over our web and, and mobile clients, um, and we just recently started to set up a lending as a service business where we can integrate our products with partners to offer, for instance, a point of sale finance or a complementary credit product for financial institutions that don't serve our customers. The company, well, I mean, we started Credit Tech in 2012. Today we have uh, scored more than three and a half million loan applications and have underwritten more than one million loans and um, have, uh, well, obviously, I mean, I mean, raised, I mean, a substantial amount of equity, which is important because, I mean, we do manage our own balance sheet, so we need to have that available and uh, can then obviously now, nowadays, I mean, refinance most of our originations via institutional capital, uh, which, we, uh, which we eventually securitize. We have a couple of very... I mean, basically, great investor backing, and as of our last round, I mean, we managed to, to get uh, JC Flowers, the World Bank, and Peter Thiel on board. Last year, we did 100 million in originations and almost 40 million uh, in, in, in top-line revenue. 
And this year already, I mean, since the beginning of the year, we uh, managed to grow our revenue by more than 50% and have actually doubled originations uh, as of January. Um, so we're very happy, obviously, with the progress of the business, and that's why moving substantially into lower interest rates and uh, uh, in, in, into new markets. Basically, to close my talk, um, this is just sort of like a snapshot of the impact that we're having, having all around the world. So this is, uh, I mean, over the last seven days, we have eventually originated more than 12,000 loans to customers who had not access to, uh, to those before, um, sort of like between the polar cycle and the equator, spanning a very, very wide geographic distance. And the cool thing is that, I mean, those are really people, I mean, that either because of their credit history had no way of obtaining loans before or they're simply not nearby any bank branch, for instance, let's look at this point, they're somewhere in Siberia, or, I mean, were in the need, I mean, to obtain capital at a point where, for instance, banks were closed. So, so to sum up, I mean, our goal as a company is to really, I mean, make sure that credit, consumer credit around the world is no longer a two-class system, and we see ourselves as putting people into control of their lives uh, by making sure they have fair and easy access to capital when needed, or, as we can summarize it, improve financial freedom through technology. So, thank you very much. <laughs>